Porcupines are not fast animals, and they have many potential predators, such as wolves, bears, cougars, black cats or lynx, eagles, and owls. In view of these circumstances, how do porcupines live their lives and protect themselves? Porcupines are rodents, just like mice and chipmunks, but larger, more the size of beavers. Being a porcupine is a successful strategy. There are porcupines all over the world, in North America, South America, Asia, and Africa. But I'll be talking about the familiar North American porcupine, Arathosan dorsatum. They have a broad range from the East Coast to the West Coast of North America, and North-South from Alaska to California. These porcupines have strong skulls and ever-growing teeth like beavers, which they use to gnaw bark from trees, again like beavers. But whereas beavers defend themselves by creating a moat of water around their beaver lodge, porcupines defend themselves with a thick body covering of needle-sharp quills. This allows them to wander freely through the forest without being tied to a lodge and pond. Porcupine quills are modified hairs stiffened with keratin, the stuff that makes up your fingernails. The quills are hollow and are filled with air, allowing porcupines to float and swim with ease. The hollow structure also allows the quills to break off from the porcupine and remain lodged in the flesh of any creature that has had the audacity to attack a porcupine. Porcupines don't shoot their quills, like projectiles, but rather a quick swat of a well-quilled porcupine tail will quickly transfer a load of quills to the would-be predator, often to its face. Dogs are particularly apt to receive a face full of quills from a porcupine, and we know the details of this because veterinarians keep records of the number of dogs they treat for porcupine quills every year. The quills have barbs, and unless they are skillfully removed, they will work their way through the flesh of the would-be predator, possibly damaging vital organs and maybe even killing the predator. In addition to their quill defenses, porcupines are also excellent tree climbers. They can produce a bad scent that other animals learn to avoid, they chatter their teeth and shake their quills aggressively, and they tend to be most active at night when they are less likely to be seen. Is there a particular porcupine hunter? Yes, the fisher is a specialized porcupine predator. The fisher is a mustelid, a relative of weasels, badgers, and wolverines that is about the size of a large cat with short legs. Contrary to its name, it doesn't specialize in eating fish, it specializes in eating porcupines. The fisher lives in continuous forest cover, where it prefers older coniferous habitat that is fairly close to younger forest in order to have a range of prey, such as porcupines, snowshoe hares, and other small animals. It has a lustrous brown fur that is much valued by the fur industry. Why is the fisher such a successful porcupine hunter? Most predators attack the porcupine from above and so are deterred by its quills. But the porcupine's weak spots are its face and its belly. Fishers are short, fast, and persistent predators that strike the porcupine's face again and again until it is badly wounded. Then they flip the porcupine on its back and attack its undefended belly. Fishers are excellent climbers so they can hunt porcupines that are in the trees and force them to the ground to attack them there. Fishers are very effective at controlling porcupine numbers. When fisher populations decline, perhaps through intense trapping or logging of older trees, porcupine populations will increase dramatically. When fisher populations are allowed to recover, or when they are reintroduced to areas where they were previously wiped out, porcupine numbers decrease dramatically. Clearly, fishers have much to do with regulating porcupine numbers. How to make more porcupines? People sometimes ask, how do prickly porcupines have sex in order to make more porcupines? The answer is, very carefully and with the full cooperation of the female. To begin with, the female climbs a tree and releases an odor to attract male porcupines. The male porcupines that are attracted duke it out teeth and quill to see who will mate with the female. There's a fair bit of X-rated content involved in porcupine mating, and YouTube might not approve of it, so I will put some references at the end of the video, and I'll show you a romantic sunset. I can tell you that there's a good deal of calling, grunting, and nudging noses, and this can go on for several days. Then, if and when she is ready, she will lower her quills to a flat position and raise her tail to allow the male to fertilize her. Some of this activity takes place in the relative safety of trees, and some of it takes place on the ground. But unlike most mammals, the actual copulation can take place again and again over considerable time, making darn sure that there will be more porcupines in the world. The ladies in particular may be wondering how mother porcupines give birth to these prickly little creatures. First of all, the mother usually only has one newborn offspring called a porcupette. Its quills are initially as soft as hair, 
and they will soon become stiffened with keratin into sharp needles in the days ahead. The porcupine can nurse safely at its mother's undefended underside until it is weaned at about four months. Young porcupines become independent soon after weaning and can breed at two years of age. In comparison, fishers have litters of one to four kits per mother and they are weaned after about 10 weeks. The young fishers are independent at one year and can breed at one to two years of age. What else about porcupines and fishers? Populations of both species are healthy in most places. In fact, they are increasing in some places. Both species can be negatively affected through deforestation and forest fires, taking away their forest habitat. Both species are also vulnerable to being roadkill. Porcupines are slow and overconfident in their quill defenses when crossing roads. Fishers are simply wide-ranging animals that cross roads frequently, and so are hit by cars, particularly at night. In addition, fishers are trapped for their fur, and porcupines are sometimes treated as pests for damaging trees and chewing man-made structures. You can imagine that the owner of this outhouse would not be pleased with this porcupine. So now you know more about the intertwined lives of porcupines and fishers. If you'd like to know more about other environmental topics, see my Udemy course referenced below this video, or see one of the other YouTubes suggested on your screen. If you'd like to know more about porcupine sex, see the articles listed below the video. Feel free to send me comments and questions. Share with your friends. See you next video.